We're here about to go live here in a selfie on the pre Silicon Valley Friday show. We're about to go live for our show for Silicon Valley Friday. We've got a great lineup. We're talking about Twitter. Twitter's earned Donald Trump and all his viral tweets. Now there's an algorithm out there that creates a shorting stock called Trump and Dumb. We're going to talk to the, the, the inventor of that new app. A bunch of other great stuff. Controversy around Silicon Valley and Intel. Controversy on Google. Seconds. And we'll be watching a great show. Hopefully, you'll be watching. From Cube Headquarters in Palo Alto, California, it's the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Silicon Valley Friday Show. I'm John Furrier. We are here live in Palo Alto, California for the Silicon Valley Friday Show. Every Friday morning we broadcast what's going on in Silicon Valley, what's going on in the streets. We call up people and find out what's going on. This show, we got a great lineup. We're going to talk about, I'll see the news, Twitter earnings are out, but more, we're going to have some fun segment where we have a, an algorithm, a bot, an AI bot that goes out there and takes all of Donald Trump's tweets and creates a shorting of the stock and creates making money. Apparently, Donald Trump's tweets do move the market. We're going to talk about uh, Snapchat, Snap Inc.'s IPO and a refile and some controversy going around that. Also, controversy around Intel Corporation that just announced a fab plant in Arizona, and the CEO is in the White House uh, making the announcement, giving the impression that Donald Trump was all behind this. Turns out the CEO is a Republican and supports Donald Trump, when apparently this has been in the works for multiple years. So not sure that's going to be a game changer for Trump, but certainly Intel's taking advantage of the schmooze factor and the PR stunt and has people in Silicon Valley up in arms, obviously, Intel is uh, pro-immigration, uh, bringing people in. Obviously, Andy Grove was an immigrant legend of, of, of Intel. And we had also tons of stuff going on. We're going to preview Mobile World Congress, the big show in Barcelona at the end of the month. We're doing a two-day special here, live in Palo Alto. We're going to do a special new Silicon Valley version of Mobile World Congress. We'll give you a preview. We're going to talk to some analysts. And also, it's fake news, fake accuracy, and all the stuff that's going on. What is fake news? What is inaccurate news? Is there a difference? Does it matter? Certainly it does. We have an opinion on that. So great show lineup. First is obviously Twitter earnings are out and they kind of missed and hit. Um, they're up on the monthly uh, active uniques by 2 million people. A total of, uh, I think, 300 million uh, people are using the number here. Just on my notes here says that the, uh, they're up to 319 million active monthly active users. And of course, Trump has been taking advantage of Twitter and uh, the, the Trump bump did not happen for Twitter although some say Trump kept it alive, but Trump is using Twitter. And he's been actively on Twitter and it's causing a lot of people. We've talked about it many times on this show. But the funniest thing that we've seen and probably the coolest thing that's interesting is that there's an entrepreneur out there, an agency guy named Brian um, uh, Ben Gaddis, I'm sorry, president of T3. He's a branding guy, created a viral video. It was on NPR yesterday, all over the news went viral. He created an AI chatbot that essentially takes Donald Trump's tweets, analyzes any company mentioned, and then instantly shorts the stock of that company. Wow. And apparently it's working. So uh, we're going to take a look at that. We're also going to talk to him and find out what's going on. We're going to have Ben Rosenbaum on. We're going to have someone from Intel on. We have a lot of great guests. So uh, let's take a look at this clip of the Trump and Dump, and then we're going to talk to Ben right after. T3 noticed something interesting about Twitter lately, particularly when this guy gets hold of it. Anytime a company mentions moving to Mexico or overseas or just doing something bad, he's on it. He tweets, the stock tanks. Tweet, tank. Tweet, tank. Tweet, tank. Everyone's talking about how to make sense of all this. T3 thought the unpredictability of it created a real opportunity. Meet the Trump and Dump automated trading platform. Trump and Dump is a bot powered by a complex algorithm that helps us short stocks ahead of the market. Here's how. Every time he tweets, the bot analyzes the tweet to see if a publicly traded company is mentioned. Then, the algorithm runs an instant sentiment analysis of the tweet in less than 20 milliseconds. It figures positive or negative. A negative tweet triggers the bot to short the stock. Like earlier this month, his Toyota tweet immediately tanked the stock, but the Trump and Dump bot was out ahead of the market. It shorted the second after his tweet. As the stock tanked, we closed our short and we made a profit. Huge profit. Oh, and we donated our profits here. So now, when President Trump tweets, 
we save a puppy. It's the Trump and Dump automated trading platform. Twitter monitoring, sentiment analysis, complex algorithms, real-time stock trades. All fully automated, all in milliseconds. And all for a good cause. From your friends at T3. Okay, we're back here in Silicon Valley Friday show. I'm John Furrier. You just saw the Trump and Dump, Trump and Dump video, and the creator of that is Ben Gaddis on the phone, president of T3, a privately owned think tank focused on branding. Uh, ben, thanks for, for joining us today. Thanks for having me, John. Glad so, to talk with you. So big news, NPR had it on their page, which had the embed on there, and it went viral. Um, great video. But first, talk about talk about the motivation. What, what's, what's going on behind this video? This is very cool. Explain to the folks out there what this Trump and Dump video is about. Why did you create it, and, and how does it work? So we had, uh, just like I think every, almost everyone in the United States, we were having conversations about what do you do with the fact that President Trump is tweeting and tweeting about these companies in, in many cases negatively. Uh, so we saw articles talking about it and actually one day a guy in our New York office came up with this idea that we ought to follow those tweets in real time and if he mentions a publicly traded company negatively, short the stock. And so we kicked that idea around uh, over Slack and in about 30 minutes we had an idea for the platform and about two days later, one of our engineers had actually built it. Yeah. And so what the platform does is it, it's really actually, it's simple yet complex. It listens to every uh, tweet that the president puts out, and then it does uh, two things. It determines if there's a publicly traded company mentioned, and if there is, then it actually does sentiment analysis in real time. So in about 20 milliseconds, it can tell us if the tweet is positive or negative. If it's negative, we've seen the stocks typically go down and we short sell that stock and so the profit that we develop from that then we donate it to the ASPCA and and then uh, hopefully we, we save a puppy or two in the process yeah and that's key I think that's one thing I liked about this was you weren't arbitraging you weren't like a real-time seller like these finance guys on Wall Street which by the way have all these complex trading algorithms yours is very specific the, the variables are basically Donald Trump public company and he tends to be kind of a negative tweeter so most of do with you know, moving to Mexico or some sort of you know um, slam or bullying kind of tweet he does and which moves the market and this is interesting though because you're teasing out something clever and cool on the AI kind of side of life and you know uh, some sort of semantic bot that's essentially looks at some context and looks at the impact. But this is kind of the real world we're living in now. These kinds of statements from a president of the United States or anyone who's in a position of authority literally moves the market. So you're not doing it to make money. You're doing it to prove a point, which is that the responsibility here is all about getting it exposed in a sense that you got to be careful what you say on Twitter when you're the president of the United States. I mean, it was me saying it. I mean, I'm not going to move the market, but certainly, you know, the press who have impact large groups of people, and certainly the president does that. So did you guys have that in mind when you were thinking about this? Well, we did. I mean, I think, you know, our goal was uh, this is what we do for a living. We help big brands monitor uh, all their digital uh, presence and, and build digital strategies. So, so we're already monitoring uh, sentiment around Twitter and around social platforms. So... Uh, it's, it's pretty core to what we do, uh, but we're also looking at things that are happening in pop culture and, uh, and, and societally what, uh, what kind of impact uh, social might have on business. And so the fact that we're able to take an action and deliver a social action and deliver a real business outcome is pretty core to what we do. What's different here and what's so unique is the fact that we've never really seen uh, – Things like policy, um, whether it's monetary uh, policy or uh, just general policy, be distributed through one platform like Twitter and have such a big impact. So we think it's kind of a societal shift that is sort of the new norm uh, that uh, I don't know that everyone has figured out what to do with yet. And so our goal is just to experiment and decide, one, can we consume the information fast enough to take an action? And then how do we build through AI platforms that allow us to uh, be smarter in the world that we're living in today that is uh, very, very unpredictable? 
We were at Ben Gaddis, who's president of T3, also the part of the group that did the Trump and Dump video, but he brings out a great point about using data and looking at the collective impact of, of uh, information in real time. And this is interesting. I, I was looking at the, 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 um, some of the impact last night uh, in, in this, and Nordstrom's had a tweet about Ivanka Trump and the Nordstrom. Apparently, Nordstrom stock is up, so is there a flaw in the algorithm uh, here? Uh, what's, the, what's the take on that? Because in a way, that's a, the reverse of the bullying. He's defensive on that one. So is there a, a sentiment well, of him being more offensive not. or defensive? Uh, it's, pretty, it's, it's pretty standard. So we're starting to see a pattern. So what happens is, uh, uh, and the stock actually, the Nordstrom stock actually did go down um, right after the tweet. Uh, and so we saw that, uh, that that's a pattern that's typical when the president tweets negatively. When he tweets positively, we don't see that much of a bump. When he tweets negatively, typically the stop, stock drops anywhere between 1% and 4%, sometimes even greater than that. But it rebounds very quickly. So a big part of what we're trying to do with the uh, bot and the algorithm is understand how long do we hold and what is that time frame before people will actually come back to more of a rational uh, state and, and start to buy back a stock that's, that's valuable. Now, what's really interesting, you mentioned uh, you know, the, the algorithm and, and, and whether there's a flaw in it. Uh, we learned something very interesting yesterday about Nordstrom's. So the president tweeted, and in that tweet, he talked negatively about Nordstrom, but he also talked very positively about his daughter, Ivanka. And so the algorithm actually picked up uh, that tweet and registered it as 61.5% uh, positive, so it didn't trade. Uh, so we actually got, we got kind of lucky on that one. You bring up a good point. And this is something I want to get your thoughts on. You know, we live in an era of fake news and it's just Snapchat just filed a new IPO filing to make a change in their filing to show that Amazon is going to be a billion dollar um, uh, partner as well, which wasn't in the filing. So there's a line between pure fake news, which is essentially just made up stuff and inaccurate news. So what you're kind of pointing out is a new mechanism mm -hmm. to take advantage of the collective intelligence of real-time information. And so this is kind of a new concept in the media business. And brands who used to advertise with big media companies are now involved in this. So as someone who's you know an architect for brand and understanding data, how are brands becoming more data-driven? Well, I think what brands are, are realizing is that they, they live in this world that is more real time. That's such a buzzword, uh, but more real time than it, than I think they even, uh, thought would ever be possible. The fact that, uh, someone like the president can tweet and have, uh, you know, literally cut off billions of dollars in market cap value, um, in, in a moment's time is something that they have to figure out. So I think the first thing is, having the tools in place to actually monitor and understand, and then having a plan in place to react to things that are really quite unpredictable. So not only, uh, I don't think that you can have a plan for everything, but you have to at least have a plan for understanding um, how you get legal approval on a response. Yeah. Uh, who would be responsible for that? Uh, you know, who do you work with, uh, either through partners or inside your organization, uh, to you know, to be able to respond to something when you need to get back in probably, you know, minutes versus, uh, versus hours. Uh, the thing that we don't hear people talking as much about is uh, we're, our goal with this was to see how close we can get to the information. So we consume the data from Twitter's fire hose. So we get it hopefully when everyone else does. And then our goal is to take an action on that quicker than anybody else. And that delta is where we'll make a profit. What's really interesting to me is that the only person closer to that information than the president is Twitter. Ben, great to have you on. Appreciate it. I'd love to get you back on as a guest. We, we love to talk about as our motto here at Silicon Angle is extracting the signal from the noise. And certainly the game is changing. You're working with brands and the old model of ad agencies. This is a topic we love to cover here. The old ad agency model certainly becoming much more platform oriented with data. These real time uh, tools, really super valuable. Having a listening engine, having some actionable mechanisms to go out there and, and be part of and influence the conversation with information seems to be a good trend that you guys are really riding. Um, We'd love to have you back on. We'd love to be back on, and thanks for uh, 
Thanks for the time. We enjoyed it. It was Ben Gaddis, who's the president of T3, uh, the, the firm behind the Trump and Dump, but more importantly, highlighting a really big mega trend, which is the use of data, understanding its impact, having some analysis, and trying to figure out what it means for people. We'll be right back with more after the short break. Why wait for the future? The next evolution in IT infrastructure is happening now. And Cisco's unified computing system is ready to power your data center in the internet of everything. Urgent data center needs went unaddressed for years. So Cisco wiped the slate clean and built a new fabric-centric computing architecture that addresses the application delivery challenges faced by IT in the dynamic environments of virtualization, cloud, and big data. Cisco UCS represents true innovation with revolutionary integration. It improves performance while dramatically driving down complexity and cost, far lower than alternatives from the past. Cisco's groundbreaking solution is producing real results for a growing list of satisfied customers now moving to unified computing, transforming how IT can perform, pushing out the boundaries of performance and scale, and changing the face of business from the inside out, right now. The industry is witnessing the next wave of computing. So, why should your business wait for the future? Unify your data center with Cisco UCS. You're listening to Cube Fridays, brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media. Now, here's John Furrier. Okay, welcome back to the Silicon Valley Friday Show. I'm John Furrier. Great show today. Our next guest is Dan Rosenbaum, who is the editor of Wearable um, Tech Insider, um, Media Pro, been around in the industry for years, been, in, been a, a journalist, reporter, editor, variety through his career, knows the uh, tech business, certainly on the infrastructure level all the way up to the device. So Dan, welcome to the show. Great to have you. Thanks for uh, being available. He's, he's in New York, so Palo Alto, New York uh, connection here. Yeah, we got about uh, maybe an hour or so of snow left, uh, but you know, it's, it's February, it does this in New York. <laughs> Great to have you on. We were just talking on our earlier segment for the break of the guy who created the Trump and Dump video, which is a chat bot that goes out, looks at Donald Trump's tweets, and then identifies it as a public company, shorts the stock, and donates it to save uh, puppies. Um, so they're not doing it for profit, but they're, you know, they have their intelligence and listening. And we were just riffing on the concept of the difference between fake news and inaccuracy and a new dynamic that's impacting the media business, which is real-time information, data, and certainly the world that you're in with wearables, this new Internet of Things, um, which is hard to understand for most common people, but it's really the AI new connected network is really impacting uh, things, certainly how people get information, how fast they create data, and it's, it's changing the industry landscape, certainly from a media standpoint. You, you get on TV in the mainstream... It really uh, is. When the press secretary stood up and said that, that the administration sees the media as, as the adversary, you know, everyone got sort of upset about it, but, you know, in a lot of ways it's true, and that, that, that's the, the, the fitting way that, that the media and, and any any administration, any any power structure, uh, should be facing each other. I mean, it's the job of the media to 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 report the the truth as best it can determine and as accurately as it can. Now, there there, there are different impacts depending on which which sphere you're in. In, in politics, there's, there's always going to be sort of the tension of well, we think we we look at these facts and we think that, and we we look at those facts and, and think. Think the other. And I think ultimately this new formats that are developing really comes back down to, I would add to that, is trust. This is a collision course of a complete retransformation of the media landscape. And you know, technology is at the heart of it. And you know, you're in the middle of it with wearables. You're seeing that at the edge of the network. These are new phenomenons. What's your take on this new trend of you know, uh, computing? Uh, I'm not saying singularity yet, as Ray Kurzweil would say. But you know, ultimately, it is going down to the point now where it's on your, on your body, potentially in your body. But this is a new form of connection. What's, the, what's your thoughts on this? Twelve years ago, I was at the, the party where they launched MSNBC, and I ran into Andy Lack, who was the, the CEO of MSNBC at the time, and, and asked him why NBC was cutting this, this collaboration deal with Microsoft, because remember, that's how it started, yeah. when there wasn't any means for the news to flow upwards. 
there was no way for citizen news gathering to be represented on this Microsoft NBC joint venture. And Andy Lack sort of looked down his nose and he sneered, well, who in the world would want people to be contributing to the news? Well, now we're, now we're 10, 12 years later, and, and as you say, Snapchat and Skype and, and, and all these mobile technologies have just transformed how people get their information because there are now witnesses, and there are witnesses everywhere. Um, one of, one of the, the, the big transformations in, about wearable technology is that computing infrastructure has moved from islands of, of standalone massive computers to networks of massive computers, to standalone PCs, to networks of PCs. And now the, the, the model for computing and communication is the personal area network. The, the, the idea of, of uh, sensor-based technologies is, is going to change, or already has changed uh, the world of news. It's in the process of changing the world of medicine. Um, it's, it's in the process of changing uh, the way we build houses, the, the, the construction business, uh, we, with the smart home, the way that we, we build and relate to cities. So we're here with Dan Rosenbaum, who's the editor of Wearable Tech Insider, but more importantly, he's been a tech uh, insider in media and going way back, he's seen the, the cycles of innovation. Love your point about the flowing conversations coming up, the MSNBC kind of executive and the old broadcast models. I mean, I have four kids, my oldest is 21. They don't use, they don't really care about cable TV anymore. So, you know, this now new narrative. So those executives that are making those comments are either retired or will be dinosaurs. You now have Amazon, you have Netflix, you have, you know, folks trying to look at this internet TV model where it's fully asynchronous. So now you have collective intelligence of vertical markets that have real-time ability to surface information up to bigger outlets. So this collective media intelligence is happening and it's all being driven right. by mobile technology. You know, with that being said, you know, you're in the business, we got Mobile World Congress coming up. What is uh, that show turning into? Because it's not about the mobile device anymore. The iPhone's 10 years old. That's a game changer. It's growing up. The impact of mobile is now beyond the device. Mobile World Congress is, is all about wireless infrastructure. It goes from everything from the one millimeter square sensor to the, the national grade wireless network. Um, but what's really cool about Mobile World is that it's the place where communications or telecom ministers get together with infrastructure carriers, get together with, with the hardware hardware manufacturers, and they hash out the problems that will result 5, 10, 15 years down the road in new products and new services. This is the place where everyone comes together. The back rooms at Mobile World Congress are the hottest place, and the back rooms are the places that you can't get into. Uh, we're here with Dan Rosenbaum, who's an industry industry veteran, also on the media front lines and wireless technology. I mean, wearable technology, and among other things. Good view of the landscape. Final point: I want to just get a quick comment from you. I saw was uh, watching uh, on Facebook. You had a great post around Facebook is feeding you an ad for a nineteen million dollar estate in Litchfield, Connecticut, and then you said one of one of us has the wrong idea. So you must be really loaded. Um, this retargeting bullshit on Facebook is just ridiculous. I mean, come on, this is bad big data, isn't it? Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, 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 the boast of Google is that they want to make uh, you know, ads so relevant that they look like content. Well, in the process of getting there, there, there there's going to be misses. <laughs> so if, if this real estate agent decided that they wanted to hit everyone in, in my zip code or everyone in my county uh, or whatever, and they wanted to pay the, the $5 so that I'd see that video, God bless them. Let them do it. It's not going to make me... Uh, it's not going to overcome any kind of sales resistance. Um, yeah. I don't know that I want to, to move up to Litchfield, Connecticut, anyway. But if I did, um, sure, a nineteen million dollar house would be really nice. You can but, take a, You uh, can take a chopper into Manhattan. You, you know, just drop back. into Manhattan with a helicopter. They, they wouldn't want to take it. All right. You can always take the helicopter in from Litchfield, you know, right at the top of the, your building. <laughs> Dan, thanks so much for spending the time. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll, we'll have to bring circle back with you on our two-day Mobile World Congress uh, special in Palo Alto we'll be doing. So appreciate the time. Thanks a lot. Love to do it. Thanks for having me.
Okay, that was Dan Rosenbaum really talking about going down in the weeds a little bit, but really more importantly, this Mobile World Congress, what's going on with this new trend, digital transformation, really is about the impact to the consumer. And what's going on in Silicon Valley right now is there's some hardcore tech that is changing the game from what we used to know as a device. The iPhone's only 10 years old. You know, 10 years old, before the iPhone, essentially it was a phone. You made phone calls, maybe surf it the web through some bad browser and do text messages. That's now completely transforming, not just the device, it's a platform. So what we're going to see is new things that are happening, and the, and the tell signs are there. Self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles, drones delivering packages from Amazon. A completely new digitized world is coming. This is the real trend, and we're going to have uh, an executive from Intel on next to tell us kind of what's going on, because Intel is at the ground zero of the innovation with Moore's Law and, this, and, this, and the integrated circuit, but they're bringing their entire Intel inside as a global platform and this is really going to be driven through a ton of 5G, a new technology. So we're going to dig in on that and we're going to call, have a call in from her. She's going to be coming in from uh, Oregon. And again, we're going to get down to the engineers, the people making the chips under the hood and, and bringing that to you here in the Silicon Valley Friday Show. I'm John Furrier. We'll be right back after this short break. My name is Dave Vellante and I'm a longtime industry analyst. So when you're as old as I am, you've seen a lot of transitions. Everybody talks about industry cycles and waves. I've seen many, many waves. Met a lot of industry executives and I'm a little bit of a, an industry historian. When you interview many thousands of people, probably five or 6,000 people, as I have over the last half of a decade, you get to interact with a lot of people's knowledge and you begin to develop patterns. And so that's sort of what I bring is, is an ability to catalyze the conversation and you know, share that knowledge with others in the community. Our philosophy is everybody's expert at something. Everybody's passionate about something and has real deep knowledge about that something. Well, we want to focus in on that area and extract that knowledge and share it with our communities. This is Dave Vellante. Thanks for watching The Cube. You're listening to the Silicon Valley Friday Show with John Furrier. Okay, welcome back to the Silicon Valley Friday Show, everyone. I'm John Furrier. We're here in Palo Alto for this Friday show. We're going to go under the hood and get into some technology impact around what's going on in the industry, specifically uh, kind of as a teaser for Mobile World Congress at the end of the month. It's a big show in Barcelona, uh, Spain, where the whole mobile and infrastructure industry comes together. It's kind of like CES, Consumer Electronics Show uh, in, in the mobile world, but it's, a, it's evolved in a big way and it's certainly impacting everyone in the industry and all consumers and businesses. This is Intel, Lincomp, and this is Intel who we know about Moore's Law, we know about all the chips that make everything happen. Intel has been the, the engine of innovation from the PC revolution, it's been the engine of innovation now in the cloud. And as Intel looks at the next generation, they are the key player in this transformation that we are seeing with AI, wearable computers, Internet of Things, self-driving cars, AI. This is all happening, new stuff's going on. Lynn, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. So you're up in Oregon. Thanks for taking the time to uh, allow us to talk via phone. Appreciate it. Um, obviously, Intel, we've been following you guys, and I've been a big fan since 1987 when I almost worked there right out of college. Went to Hewlett Packard instead, but that's a different story. But great, great innovation over the years. Intel has been the bellwether in the tech industry, been a big part of the massive change. But now as you look at the next generation, I mean, I have four kids and they don't watch cable TV. They don't, like, they don't do the things that we used to do. They're on the mobile phone all the time. And the iPhone is now 10 years old as of this year, this early winter part of the, the Steve Jobs announced it 10 years ago. And what a change has it been? It's moved from telephone calls to a computer that happens to have software that make telephone calls. This is a game changer. But now it seems that Mobile World Congress has changed uh, from being a telephone-centric, voice-centric, phone-device-centric show to a software show. It seems to be that software is eating the world, just like CES is turning into an automotive show. What is Mobile World Congress turning into? What's the preview from Intel's perspective? You know, it's a really fascinating question because many years ago, you would only see a bunch of very, very intense base station design, you know, it was, 
it was very, very oriented around wireless, wireless technologies and radios. And those are really important because they're, they're an engine or a fabric that you can build capabilities onto. But last year, just as a reference point for how much it's changed, we had Facebook giving one of the main keynotes. And they're known for their software, they're known for social media. And so you'll see Facebook and Google was an exhibitor there last year as well. So you're not just seeing suppliers into the traditional wireless industry for equipment and the operators who are the purchaser. You're seeing many, many different players show up, very much like how you said CES has a lot of automotive there now. You, we've seen a lot of revolutions in the computer industry. Intel created a revolution called the computer revolution, the PC revolution, and then it became kind of an evolution. That seems to be the big trends you see that cycle. But it seems now that we are kind of been doing the evolution of mobile computing and my phone gets better 10 years now into the iPhone, 3G, 4G, LTE. Okay, I get. I want more bandwidth, of course, but is there, is there a revolution? Is, where can you point to? Where is the revolution versus, versus just the standard evolutionary kind of trends? Is there, is there something coming out of this that we're going to see? Yeah, that is such a great question because when you look at uh, the first digital uh, wireless technologies that came out and then you had 2G and 3G and 4G, those really were evolutionary. And what we're finding with 5G that I believe is going to be a huge theme at Mobile World Congress this year is it is a completely different ballgame. I would say it's more of an inflection point or very revolutionary. And there's a couple reasons for that, uh, both tied up in how ITU is specifying the use cases, its licensed and unlicensed spectrum, which is kind of unusual for how it's been done if you look at 2, 3, and 4G. The other thing that's really interesting about 5G that is an inflection point is there's a lot more intelligence assumed in the network, and it helps address some of the challenges I think that the industry has seen, a different industry, with some of the IoT promise and rollout, where some of the macro-designed networks that we've seen in the past the, the ability to have the right latency, the right bandwidth, and the right cost matched to the needs of a specific IoT use case it was much more limited in the past, and I think we'll see yeah. a lot more opportunities moving forward. Great, great stuff. We're with Lynn Comp, who's with the Network Platforms Group at Intel. You know, you bring up some, I like the way you're going. I mean, it's, it's, there's so much like impact of society going on with this, these big trends. But also, I was just having a conversation with some young folks here in Palo Alto, high school kids and some college kids, and they're all jazzed up about AI. You can almost see the, um, um, and, and not I won't say addiction, but fascination and intoxication with technology. And there's some real hardcore good tech going on here. Could you just share your 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 uh, thoughts on you know what are some of those things that are going to? Because uh, I mean, five G is wireless. I get that, but I mean, I, you know, these kids that, that we talk to. And folks that are in the in in the, the next generation, they love the autonomous vehicles. But sometimes I can't get a phone signal. How are cars going to talk to each other? I mean, how does this? I mean, you got to pull this together. And these kids are like right. in, 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 into these new careers. What, what's your thoughts on what are some of the game changing tech challenges that are that are coming out of this? Let's let's just start with something that was a great example this year because I. I think I have kids of similar age. Um, and I had been skeptical of things like even just virtual reality, a augmented or virtual reality. And then we had this phenomena last summer that really was just a hint. It wasn't really augmented reality, but it was a hint of the demand that could be met by it. And it's Pokemon Go. And so an example with that, I mean, it really wasn't asking a significantly higher amount of data off the network, but it did change the use profiles for many of the comm service providers in many of the networks where they realized I actually have to change the architecture, not just of what's at the edge, but in my core network to be more responsive and flexible. You're going to see something even more so with autonomous driving, even if it's just driver assist and similar to how the autopilot evolution happened, you're still going to have these usage patterns where people have too many demands, too much information coming at them. They do want that assistance or they do want that augmented experience to interact with a brand and it's going to really stress the network and there's going to have to be a lot of innovation about where some of these capabilities are placed and how much intelligence is close to the user yeah. as opposed to just a radio 
probably going to need a lot more analytics and a lot more machine learning capabilities there as well. We had a uh, seg- our segment earlier in the show was a, um, uh, an entrepreneur who created the the Trump and dump chatbot that would go out and read Donald Trump's tweets and then short all public companies that were mentioned because the trend is they would do that. But this is an example of some of these chatbots and some of this automation that's going on. And it, and it kind of brings the question up to some of the technology challenges that we're looking out of the landscape that we're discussing is the role of data really is a big deal. And, and software and data now have an interaction play where you got to move data around the networks. Ne- networks are now ubiquitous. Networks are now on people. Networks are now in cars. Networks are now part of all this, um, I won't say unstructured networks, but now omni-connected fabric. So data can really change what looks like an optimal architecture to a, fa- a failed one, if you don't think about it probably. So how do you guys at Intel think about the role of data? I mean, how do you build the new chips and how do you look at the landscape? And, 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 and is, it must be a big consideration. What's your thoughts about the, the role of data? Because it could ca- happen at any time. A tsunami of data could hit anything. Right, the tsunami of data. So for us, it's any challenge, and this is just in Intel's DNA historically, we'll get challenges as opportunities because we love to solve these really big problems. And so when you're talking about data moving around the network, you're talking about transformation of the network. Um, we're ta- we've been having a lot of discussions with operators where they see this data tsunami, they're already seeing it, and they realize, I have got to reconfigure the architecture of my network to leverage these technologies and these capabilities in a way that's relevant for the regulatory environment I'm in, but I still have to be flexible, I have to be agile, I have to be leveraging programmability instead of having to rewrite software every generation or every time a new app comes out. Lynn, thanks so much for coming on. Like we always say, uh, you know, engine room, more power. You can never have a, never have enough compute power available and network bandwidth as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, we love the, love to the increase the power. Moore's Law has been just a great thing. Keeps on chugging along. Thanks for your, for your time and joining us on the Silicon Valley Friday Show. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Take care. Okay, that's the Silicon Valley Friday Show. I'm John Furrier. Thanks so much uh, for listening. I had Ben Gaddis on, Dan Rosenbaum, and Lynn Kahn from Intel. Really breaking it down and bringing you all the best stories of the week here on the Silicon Valley Friday. Thanks for watching.